For the poet Sylvia Plath, the post-war American dream was a prison, not a paradise. She grew up in the age of Cold War witch hunts and conservative values. For clever, ambitious girls, 1950s America was suffocating. Writing was her rebellion. We have to care about Sylvia Plath because Sylvia Plath is the greatest female poet of the 20th century. Embraced by the literary world for her astonishing poetry, she spent her life besieged by inner demons. In her only novel, The Bell Jar, she told her own story. It was life as a woman of 50s America laid bare. The book is just something she shed like a skin, almost. It was one of the things she went through and she translated her experiences into that book. Spiked with lacerating honesty, female frustration and personal despair, the book gave a voice to women in an age when they were not heard still speaks to current generations and concerns about women and ambition and, and power and obstacles holding ambitious women back. Four weeks after The Bell Jar was published in 1963, Sylvia Plath committed suicide. But her book lives on. It was a queer, sultry summer, the summer they electrocuted the Rosenbergs, and I didn't know what I was doing in New York. I'm stupid about executions. The idea of being electrocuted makes me sick, and that was all there was to read about in the papers. Goggle-eyed headlines staring up at me on every street corner, and at the fusty, peanut-smelling mouth of every subway. It had nothing to do with me, but I couldn't help wondering what it would be like being burned alive all along your nerves. I thought it must be the worst thing in the world. The Bell Jar is a novel that the poet Sylvia Plath published in the early 60s that tells the tale of Esther Greenwood, a woman based pretty much on herself, as she goes through a summer that starts with all this tremendous possibility and opportunity, and slowly the opportunities and possibilities around her start to shrink. I suppose being her daughter, it would have been great if one could go back in time and unwrite it. When I read it, I didn't want it to be real. I wanted it to be fiction because, um, why would anybody want to their mother to be going through any sort of such unhappiness, such difficulty, such you know traumatic um, experiences, such a thought process? You know, over the years, as I grew up, I had to accept more and more of what happened in her life. Look what can happen in this country, they'd say. A girl lives in some out-of-the-way town for 19 years, so poor she can't afford a magazine. And then she gets a scholarship to college and wins a prize here and a prize there and ends up steering New York like her own private car. Only I wasn't steering anything, not even myself. It was quite clear that she wanted to become a, a writer. She wrote poetry and she wrote for school assignments and she wrote very well. She was uh, probably the, the smartest person in our class. I thought that I could not be hurt. I thought that I must surely be impervious to suffering, immune to pain or agony. I knew that she was writing poetry and there were times when she and I would sit out in my backyard with a, a, a pad of lined paper and she would write and I would write. And of course, I have no idea what I wrote. How frail the human heart must be, a mirrored pool of thought, 
so deep and tremulous an instrument of glass that it can either sing or weep. Sylvia Plath grew up in Winthrop, Massachusetts until the age of eight when her father died. So she lost one parent at a very young age and was pretty traumatized by that incident. Her mother, Aurelia, was the breadwinner. That was very unusual at that time. I think they did the best they could. And Aurelia was always paying for dancing lessons and piano lessons. And, but you do get the sense that um, she had definite class anxieties. Um, and she kind of learned to live this double life. I am jealous of those who think more deeply who write better, who draw better, who ski better, who look better, who live better, who love better than I. She was so talented, it was hard to imagine that she wouldn't have had ambitions to be a writer. And it was not hard to see that girl was going places. There were 12 of us at the hotel. We had all won a fashion magazine contest by writing essays and stories and poems and fashion blurbs. And as prizes, they gave us jobs in New York for a month. I got the telegram. We all got these nice special little telegrams saying, congratulations, you have won. <laughs> and I was ecstatic. No one believed it. It was an extraordinarily competitive internship. So when Plath got it, she was absolutely thrilled. I mean, this was sort of the pinnacle. This was the best that you could do. Expenses paid and piles and piles of free bonuses, like ballet tickets and passes to fashion shows and hairstylings at a famous expensive salon and chances to meet successful people in the field of our desire and advice about what to do with our particular complexions. It was a chance to come to New York to be in the major fashion magazine for young women at that time. Most of the action in the Bell Jar is based on true events. Sylvia is just a good reporter. Everybody is recognizable in the book, but she combined us. She's looking at Esther Greenwood. She's looking at this character eight years on. She's describing events that happened in 1953 and 1961. So she's looking at Esther through the lens of irony and the lens of history. America was selling an image of strength and prosperity, beautiful green lawns in front of all the suburban houses. This sense of post-war optimism, I think, was in the air. You know, people were getting married earlier, having more children. Just a general sense of, of optimism. The growing menace of communism arouses the House of Representatives Un-American Activities Committee. Among the well but of course there was a, a dark side to that. Uh, are you a member of the Communist Party or have you ever been a member are of the Communist Party? Are you a member of the Communist Party? party? This was the period of the McCarthy anti-communist hearings. And so there was that very conservative fear of, of the Soviet Union and of communism and of nuclear holocaust. Are you a member of the Communist Party? I have replied to that. You have no right to ask me that. The witnesses through... Certainly McCarthy was uh, finding uh, co communists under everybody's bed. He was scaring people. It was not a good time to veer from the prescribed course if you weren't white. You know, if you were African-American, if you were gay, if you were trans if you were a woman, if you were Jewish, and on and on and on. I mean, the 1950s were not a very good time to live as an American, really. It was a conservative country, and what your parents expected from you if you were a girl was entirely different from what they expected if you were a boy. 
I dislike being a girl, because as such, I must come to realize that I cannot be a man. In other words, I must pour my energies through the direction and force of my mate. My only free act is choosing or refusing that mate. And yet, it is as I feared. I am becoming adjusted and accustomed to that idea. Definitely there was a double standard. It was very, very wonderful to be a man in the 50s, I, th I should think. Men went to work and made the money, and the women had the children. It was very unusual for those of us who thought we could do more. They put us into a hotel called the Barbizon Hotel for Women, which was really dreadful, but we thought it was heaven, you know. Several floors of the winners. The girls' activities are carefully supervised, a reassuring factor to anxious parents back home. Here they live in a pleasant but institutional atmosphere where the visiting male is a rarity. We were so overcome with wonder. We were just absolutely astounded that we ha were here. This hotel, the Amazon, was for women only. And they were mostly girls my age with wealthy parents who wanted to be sure their daughters would be living where men couldn't get at them and deceive them. And they were all going to posh secretarial schools like Katie Gibbs, where they had to wear hats and stockings and gloves to class. Or they had just graduated from places like Katie Gibbs and were secretaries to executives and junior executives and simply hanging around in New York waiting to get married to some career man or other. The editor's name was Betsy Talbot Blackwell. And I can see her pushing Sylvia and me, and I think Denny Lane. She said, you are our writers. And I will never forget that. You are our writers. My memory of, is of just being up in the clouds all the time. I got my hair done, and I got to wear nice, beautiful clothes in the fashion show. Sylvia didn't want to be the model type. She wanted to be the uh, person that would be considered a intellectual. If you were interested in books and art and music, it was the magazine for young women at the time. Sylvia, I remember, told me that she wanted to interview a novelist. She was very driven. We were supposed to be photographed with props to show what we wanted to be. Betsy held an ear of corn to show she wanted to be a farmer's wife, and Hilda held a bald, faceless head of a hatmaker's dummy to show she wanted to design hats, and Doreen held a gold embroidered sari to show she wanted to be a social worker in India. She didn't really, she told me. She only wanted to get her hands on a sari. When they asked me what I wanted to be, I said I didn't know. Oh, sure you know, the photographer said. She wants, said J.C. wittily, to be everything. I said I wanted to be a poet. Sylvia was incredibly ambitious, and so I think she was open to a lot of experience and wanted to go to New York to, to be a guest editor, wanted to explore journalism, wanted to explore being a writer, wanted to explore being an academic. And that wasn't necessarily encouraged. She was unusual. God, let me think clearly and brightly. Let me live, love, and say it well in good sentences. Let me someday see who I am and why I accept four years of food, shelter, and exams and papers without questioning more than I do. It was a big deal to get into Smith at the time because 
people have to understand that we didn't have entree as women to, or girls at the time to Yale or Harvard, what are now co-ed schools. They only took men. They were on the whole very, very bright women. You have to understand that in that period there were perhaps a quarter of as many places for women at the top women's colleges as there were for men at the top men's colleges. Our first very long meeting was in her room, and we both sat on the floor facing one another with a lot of stuff in between. She talked about being a writer at the time. She grabbed a whole bunch of rejection slips, and she held them out to me, and she said, these are rejection slips, and they tell me that I am a writer. <laughs> The women she went to school with at Smith, some of them wanted careers and some of them didn't. Some of them were sort of there for a finishing school type experience. Having that sophisticated pedigree and then finding a, a wealthy and powerful husband. The expectation really was that you were being educated so that you would have a very intellectual household and you would bring up your children with the knowledge that you had. Carol took a general home economics course, not one which would lead to professional employment, but one which fitted her for that very important career of being Mrs. Johnson. Buddy was amazingly close to his mother. He was always quoting what she said about the relationship between a man and a woman. He was always saying how his mother said, what a man wants is a mate, and what a woman wants is infinite security. And what a man is is an arrow into the future, and what a woman is is the place the arrow shoots off from, until it made me tired. Oh, the skating sounds like loads of fun. That's one of the reasons I never wanted to get married. The last thing I wanted was infinite security and to be the place an arrow shoots off from. I wanted change and excitement and to shoot off in all directions myself like the colored arrows from a 4th of July rocket. I'll take good care of her, Mrs. Ames. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. This condition of women at the time, I found, was very well represented in the bell jar by Sylvia's kind of wavering between uh, trying to decide which man should seduce her and, and the necessity of getting married. The more I thought about it, the better I liked the idea of being seduced by a simultaneous interpreter in New York City. When Constantine asked if I would like to come up to his apartment to hear some balalaika records, I smiled to myself. My mother had always told me never under any circumstances to go with a man to a man's rooms after an evening out. It could mean only one thing. I am very fond of balalaika music, I said. Sylvia Plath journals are just dripping with sexual longing. But you were told in that era, you know, that you could not have sex. You had to guard your virginity with your life. I am envious of males. I resent their ability to have both sex, morally or immorally, and a career. I hate public opinion for encouraging boys to prove their virility and condemning women for doing so. In short, I was not angry at Dick for seducing several women, but jealous that I had been denied the same chance by society. In the bell jar, of course, Esther's mother gives her a book called A Defense of Chastity. <laughs> You know, good, good girls only went so far, 
and they were very good at sort of maintaining their technical virginity. But you, you know, you cross that line with your husband. Plath fantasized about being a man in her journal, about visiting bars and brothels and having that freedom to do so. And she was deeply upset by the injustice of the double standard. Part of her was an iconoclast, but you know, another part of her was quite conventional. So I think there are these two kind of warring forces within her and within Esther as well. She was always going out with somebody. I almost was going to use the word promiscuous, but that wasn't accurate. I mean, uh, just, just the old junior high boy crazy, I think. In fact, I think she, she was trying to unprude herself. We uh, agreed to meet in the middle of the night. She got up and snuck out, and I got up and snuck out. And uh, walked around, looked at the stars, talked about constellations, lay in the grass. We approached uh, intimacy very delicately, very carefully, very uh, cautiously, and uh, talked about it a great deal. <laughs> The boy's point of view was, I guess, really to to score, was to uh, persuade the women to forget about marriage. And, and indeed, there's a whole exchange of letters between Sylvia and myself on that score, because after we had this discussion at, about marriage and, and virginity and so on, I s persisted in trying to convince her that that was very stodgy and we should just go ahead. It's a very embarrassing letter, actually, now that I think about it. And, we can't. and Sylvia wrote back and simply reminded me of the facts of life from a woman's point of view. And, of course, all of this was before the pill, which changed everything. The women were really, and Sylvia just said, you know, it's all very well for you to take this position, but I have to consider the possibility of pregnancy. I went to the window and oh. peeped through the blind oh. and asked him to tell me what was on oh. his mind. He said, but honey. Suddenly, after I finished a poem, he said, Esther, have you ever seen a man? The way he said it, I knew he didn't mean a regular man or a man in general. I knew he meant a man naked. No, I said, only statues. Well, don't you think you would like to see me? I didn't know what to say. She said, I'd like to know what you want with me. All I'd heard about, really, was how fine and clean Buddy was, and how he was the kind of person a girl should stay fine and clean for. So I didn't really see the harm in anything Buddy would think up to do. Well, all right, I guess so, I said. I stared at Buddy while he unzipped his chino pants and took them off and laid them on a chair and then took off his underpants that were made of something like nylon fishnet. They're cool, he explained, and my mother always says they wash easily. Then he just stood there in front of me, and I kept on staring at him. The only thing I could think of was turkey neck and turkey gizzards, and I felt very depressed. No other love have I. Dear Mother, the dance on Wednesday night produced no potential dates for me and most of the other girls, although a few ended up with eligible New Yorkers. However, in itself, it was spectacular and most thrilling. We had cocktails on the outdoor sky terrace of the St. Regis roof. I had my picture taken, daiquiri in hand, big beaming smile of joy on face. Wish I could get the big copy of it, because it is a great picture of me. Will appear in minute size in mag all over nation with captions something like, Sylvia and Anne smile ecstatically over champagne and two male dates of girls in the office. They had uh, very nice young men that were there to uh, be our table mates. 
my date eventually wanted me to see the Stark Club and see uh, Greenwich Village and showed me a, a good time on the town afterward. I hadn't uh, been uh, one to drink much. I was only a freshman. Um, I had a lot to drink that night. And, you know, it was just taken for granted that men could, um, I, I suppose, have, I don't want to say, I, I can't say it. <laughs> After the uh, tour of Greenwich Village, he showed me his apartment with his original painting of Charlie Knickerbocker. I couldn't leave New York without seeing that. And uh, I stayed the weekend. I stayed the weekend. We never left. As a result, um, I, uh, I came home pregnant. I had a, uh, a son delivered in uh, March of 54. I gave away the baby. There was a, a boy out there, 65 years old, so, you know. You couldn't work and have children. I remember uh, I, in Chicago when I first got pregnant, I ran into my office. It was a newspaper. And I said, I'm pregnant. And, and the man in front of me said, you're fired. That was the 50s. I just bumped from my hotel to work and to parties, and from parties to my hotel and back to work like a numb trolley bus. I guess I should have been excited the way most of the other girls were, but I couldn't get myself to react. I felt very still and very empty, the way the eye of a tornado must feel, moving dully along in the middle of the surrounding hullabaloo. Right from the start of that summer, she gets these memos from Mademoiselle saying, now you must bring um, an evening gown, you must bring this kind of outfit and this kind of outfit and hats and gloves and, and oh, and by the way, don't go down to Greenwich Village, don't go to those jazzy joints. So right from the start, her wings are kind of being clipped. There's a line in the bell jar where Esther says, everyone in New York was trying to reduce and I feel like Esther's trying to expand and, and, and she's being kind of thwarted at every turn. So to what extent that played into the depression is, is something I've always wondered. I had no idea that there were strains in her life and I did not see anything but the smile on her face and the magenta lipstick. Maybe she was a marvelous actress. It's interesting that this era should follow the war years when women were strong and were out there serving in military and making ships in factories. And they were extraordinary women doing extraordinary things. And then we come to the 50s. And we are not supposed to be extraordinary women or do extraordinary things. And I think self-doubt is a part of that. I think I had it and I, I know she had it. I think she began to feel that she was corralled into the literary equivalent of women's work, which was fashion writing. She starts to realize that Actually, I'm, I'm not going to meet Dylan Thomas. I'm not going to meet Tennessee Williams. And this isn't the New Yorker. And, and is this all, all there is? Um, and so that, that amb the ambition is up here and, and the reality is sort of here. And I think there was a wide gulf by the end of that summer between them. And that's maybe what, part of what triggered the, the breakdown.
At that vague hour between dark and dawn, the sunroof of the Amazon was deserted. Quiet as a burglar in my cornflower-sprigged bathrobe, I crept to the edge of the parapet. At my feet, the city doused its lights in sleep, its buildings blackened as if for a funeral. It was my last night. I grasped the bundle I carried and pulled at a pale tail, a strapless, elasticized slip which, in the course of wear, had lost its elasticity slumped into my hand. I waved it like a flag of truce, once, twice. The breeze caught it and I let go. A white flake floated out into the night and began its slow descent. I wondered on what street or rooftop it would come to rest. Piece by piece, I fed my wardrobe to the night wind. And flutteringly, like a loved one's ashes, the gray scraps were ferried off to settle here, there, exactly where I would never know, in the dark heart of New York. I think the veil lifts in New York City and, and she starts to think that everything is about kind of sex and money and power and, and uh, where does she fit into all this? I don't think she likes it very much. It was a wonderful, glamorous time. We had a lot of tension, a lot of things happening. You get home and there's a letdown. I think when she came home, she was utterly exhausted, feeling like the experience in New York wasn't exactly what she imagined it would be. To suddenly have nothing and be exhausted and no stimulation and unable to write. Uh, she's trying to write a novel. She can't. I think everything was just overwhelming her. It turned out that not only was I totally unable to learn one squiggle of shorthand, but I also had not a damn thing to say in the literary world, because I was sterile, empty, unlived, and unwise, and unread. I became unable to sleep. I became immune to increased doses of sleeping pills. One morning, she comes downstairs and says to her mother, um, you know, let's, let's die, let's die together. And I think she'd, she'd cut herself. And so that was the moment when Aurelia said, okay, it's time to see a doctor. Don't worry, the nurse grinned down at me. Their first time, everybody's scared to death. I tried to smile, but my skin had gone stiff like parchment. She goes to a therapist. He doesn't really ask her any questions about herself and basically says, oh, you sound mildly depressed, you need electroshock therapy. Dr. Gordon was fitting two metal plates on either side of my head. He buckled them into place with a strap that dented my forehead and gave me a wire to bite. I shut my eyes. There was a brief silence, like an indrawn breath. Then something bent down and took hold of me and shook me like the end of the world. Wee. It shrilled through an air crackling with blue light, and with each flash, a great jolt drubbed me till I thought my bones would break and the sap fly out of me like a split plant. 
I wondered what terrible thing it was that I had done. Her first treatment of shock therapy was very badly administered. No kind of anesthetic was given to her to prevent these violent muscle contractions and spasms that, that could result in broken bones. I mean, she was effectively electrocuted um, and then sort of deposited back in the waiting room. It was also costing her mother a lot of money. So I do think that's probably why she just decided, I don't want to be a burden to my family and I just want to get out of this situation. Pretty soon, the only doubt in my mind was the precise time and method of committing suicide. The only alternative I could see was an eternity of hell for the rest of my life in a mental hospital. And I was going to make use of my last ounce of free choice and choose a quick, clean ending. Suicide saved from seven-story ledge. After two hours on a narrow ledge, seven stories above a concrete parking lot and gathered crowds, Mr. George Pollucci let himself be helped to safety through a nearby window by Sergeant Will Kilmartin of the Charles Street Police Force. The trouble about jumping was that if you didn't pick the right number of stories, you might still be alive when you hit the bottom. I thought seven stories must be a safe distance. Sylvia was clearly down in the dumps, very sad. And we had a long discussion about that. And this all occurs also in the bell jar, except she's changed the nature of the discussion. Um, and the discussion that I had with her, she was talking about having writer's block that she couldn't write. The discussion she reports is one about how would you kill yourself, I think. We went into the water to swim, and we swam out. In the book, it said we were swimming towards a rock. I started to swim, a modified dog paddle keeping my face toward the rock. Cal did a slow crawl. After a while, he put his head up and treaded water. Can't make it. He was panting heavily. Okay, you go back. I do recall that we'd gotten too far from the shore, and I was not a strong swimmer, but I had the intuition that Sylvia was going to just go on out and drown. I thought I would swim out until I was too tired to swim back. As I paddled on, my heartbeat boomed like a dull motor in my ears. I am, I am. I am. And I told her that I wasn't sure I could get back without her help. She was a much stronger swimmer than I was. And so we went back and, 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 and got out of the water. And that's the scene in the bell jar. Well, I tried drowning, but that didn't work. Somehow, the urge to life Mere physical life is damn strong. And I felt that I could swim forever straight out into the sea and sun and never be able to swallow more than a gulp or two of water and swim on. The body is amazingly stubborn when it comes to sacrificing itself to the annihilating directions of the mind. That morning I had made a start. I had locked myself in the bathroom and run a tub full of warm water and taken out a Gillette blade. But when it came right down to it, the skin of my wrist looked so white and defenseless that I couldn't do it. It was as if what I wanted to kill wasn't in that skin or the thin blue pulse that jumped under my thumb, but somewhere else, deeper, more secret, and a whole lot harder to get at. She wrote a note saying that she was going out for a walk. She propped the note against a little bowl of flowers on the dining room table. And she took her mother's bottle of sleeping pills, about 40 or 50 in the bottle, 
and she went down into a crawl space in, in the family cellar. Cobwebs touched my face with the softness of moths, Wrapping my black coat round me like my own sweet shadow, I unscrewed the bottle of pills and started taking them swiftly between gulps of water one by one by one. At first, nothing happened, but as I approached the bottom of the bottle, red and blue lights began to flash before my eyes. The bottle slid from my fingers and I lay down. The silence drew off, barring the pebbles and shells and all the tatty wreckage of my life. Then at the rim of vision, it gathered itself and in one sweeping tide, rushed me to sleep. It was in all the papers. I mean, there were about 200 newspaper articles about the search for the missing Smith beauty. It was sort of tabloid news at the time. And then after three days, her brother Warren heard her moaning in the, in the cellar. We were all relieved when she, they found her and she recovered, but uh, that was the first I, I realized that, that she had um, serious mental problems. I understood totally what she was going through, how, how desperate she must have felt. I didn't feel that bell jar stifling, but I, I, I did feel abandoned, you know, by it all. When I asked her once, what, what, you know, what, what the hell happened to you? What did you do? Why did you do that? And she said, oh, it's very simple. I said, well, tell me. She said, I, I reached this point at which I was so upset or thought I was so upset that I couldn't fulfill my writing assignments and I thought I had lost my talent. I said, well, obviously you didn't. No, no, but it felt like it was gone from me and I wouldn't get it back. My mother's face floated to mind, a pale, reproachful moon at her last and first visit to the asylum since my 20th birthday, a daughter in an asylum. I had done that to her. Still, she had obviously decided to forgive me. We'll take up where we left off, Esther, she had said with her sweet martyr's smile. We'll act as if all this were a bad dream, a bad dream. To the person in the bell jar, blank and stopped as a dead baby, the world itself is the bad dream. All she knew, I think it was a vast depression, deep and dark and terrible. And she, she was so honest about saying, I cannot, will not ever live through this again if it shows itself. That will be the end of me, no matter what. Mental illness at that time carried an enormous stigma. One of Plath's neighbors told me that the stigma was so strong it almost affected the entire neighborhood. And I think for someone as ambitious and successful as Sylvia Plath was, there was an even deeper sense of shame. A part of the tragedy, I think, is that People didn't really have a language to discuss mental illness. My mother's mental illness wasn't discussed with me when I was a child at all. Um, I didn't have any awareness that she was mentally ill until I was in my teens, or that she had been mentally ill. So it was more of a voyage of discovery over the years and over, the, over life. And there'd be bits and pieces that I'd pick up. My father and I did talk about it on one or two occasions when I was older, um, and there were um, aspects, but 
you know, what to say about that without it being coming in discussion of, you know, my real mother and her very real illness as opposed to um, Esther Greenwood's experiences. I mean, my mother's, my mother's experience of the illness um, went on to evolve um, to its unfortunate conclusion. I have emerged from insulin shock and electric shock therapy with the discovery, amongst other things, that I can laugh if the occasion moves me. I need more than anything right now what is, of course, most impossible. Someone to love me. To be with me at night when I wake up in shuddering horror and fear of the cement tunnels leading down to the shock room. To comfort me with an assurance that no psychiatrist can quite manage to convey. Where do you come from, Ted? From, um, originally from Mytham Royd in West Yorkshire, near Halifax. What about you, Sylvia? Oh, I was born in Boston, Massachusetts, but, uh, I think I'm over here in England to stay now. We kept writing poems to each other. And uh, then it just grew out of that, I guess, the feeling that, that we both were writing so, so much and, and having such a fine time doing it, we decided that this should keep on. In the fall of 1955, Sylvia went over to Newnham College, Cambridge, to do a second BA in English. She met Ted Hughes in February of 1956 at a, a famous, famously raucous literary party. They married on Bloomsday, uh, 1956, so a very quick courtship. And then Ted began to become very famous, very quickly. William Heinemann wanted to publish her first book of poetry, The Colossus, so she had a lot of um, acclaim and encouragement. Now she was going to be a published poet. And I think that kind of encouragement just gave her a lot of self-confidence. Overnight, very whitely, discreetly, very quietly, our toes, our noses, take hold on the loam, acquire the air. Nobody sees us, stops us, betrays us. The small grains make room. She'd always wanted to write a novel. It had been this ambition for years and years. By 1961, I think she had the confidence to look back at her earlier breakdown and kind of um, approach it and wrestle with it in a way. Now that I uh, have attained, shall I say, uh, a respectable age and have had experiences, I feel much more interested in prose and I find that in a novel I can get more of life, perhaps not such intense life, but certainly more of life. And so I've become very interested in novel writing as a result. She was a successful writer by then. She did have this brilliant husband and a beautiful child. So she'd achieved all of these things that, that in 1953, you know, she'd been getting the message that you can't achieve that. It's, so she could sort of afford to look back without turning to salt. I don't think Sylvia could have written The Bell Jar unless she was almost an ocean between her and New York City and very happy and content with her life. You know, she had to revisit all this pain in her teenage years. And I think she realized, I have been through the most extraordinary experience and I have survived, you know, I have risen again and I'm here to tell the story. I think to give um, a voice to an experience is like letting it go. I always think um, the, the words remember it for us so we don't have to carry it anymore and we can let it float off like a little helium balloon instead of tugging a whole bunch of balloons with all our little troubles around. We can write it all down, let it go, and they're all out there. And if we ever want to be reminded, they're all there for us because we have made sure they are, but they're all at a distance. Perhaps it can imbue a sense of freedom, 
but also I think this happened to me. It was real. It was a queer, sultry summer, the summer they electrocuted the Rosenbergs, and I didn't know what I was doing in New York. I bought the bell jar uh, the day it was in the bookstores. And I uh, sat up that night and read it. I grabbed it right off the, uh, the stands, read it, and felt very close to the whole situation. So much of the book related to me and all that she was went, went through. And I say, there but for the God, grace of God go I. You know? I immediately recognized some of the people in the book. Because it was a little bit uh, rough on some of them, I was glad that I wasn't included in it. <laughs> I thought it was a very funny book, and I wasn't sure I was supposed to find it funny, but <laughs> it was Sylvia representing her younger, younger self, and I thought it fit the way we were at that time. I think she was disappointed by the reviews of The Bell Jar. They were good, solid reviews. Some of them were excellent, but I think she had hoped for more. This was her pathway to financial independence. She had always thought, if I, you know, maybe if I write a novel and it's a bestseller, I'll be financially secure. By the time The Bell Jar was published, her marriage to Ted Hughes had ended. She was living on her own in London with Frida and Nicholas. It was the worst winter you know, in, a, in a century. It was known as the Big Freeze that time in London. The children were sick. The electricity was going out, you know, intermittent heat and hot water. She was becoming more and more depressed. I thought the most beautiful thing in the world must be shadow. The million moving shapes and cul-de-sacs of shadow. There was shadow in bureau drawers and closets and suitcases and shadow under houses and trees and stones and shadow at the back of people's eyes and smiles and shadow miles and miles and miles of it on the night side of the earth. When you are in a, a deep depression, I think you feel that your children and your family would be better off without you. I think she was afraid of being hospitalized. That was not something she wanted. And I think she thought she was going mad again and just couldn't handle it. I found out the night that someone was giving my husband um, a 30th birthday party. And somebody said that Sylvia Plath had killed herself. But I remember the shock and also the understanding that it must have happened again. She, she ended her life on February 11th. Um, she turned on the gas, um, her gas oven, and uh, she folded a cloth and she put her head down. She had taped her children's door shut and she had left bread and milk for them. My first reaction was, God, if I'd been there, I could have prevented it. And uh, I probably had that thought a million times. For the several decades, I never I just was into denial about her death and still felt in contact with her. So in a way, Sylvia never died for me. I've dreamt about her many times.
Um, I treasure those years. She was the main character of my childhood, and she gave me such happiness, and I like to believe I gave the same to her. How truly sad it is that she wasn't around to witness the success of what she had created because she deserved to witness that. She deserved to understand how she had put her feelings into this beautiful novel that then gave hope to so many women, and she never got to see that. We can now look back and read The Bell Jar with a new set of eyes and a greater awareness even of what Esther was going through as an ambitious young woman trying to make her mark on New York City and the limits she comes up against. The novel still speaks to us because she did it in, in such a, a poignant and honest and authentic way. We will still be reading Sylvia Plath 100 years from now. I suppose I'd like to uh, think that people might identify with her strengths or with her um, actually phenomenal work ethic. Um, and uh, from my point of view, her desire to be a mother, um, which uh, was, was can only be a good thing where I'm concerned. And uh, so, because there was so much that was positive in her life. And I think that her end overshadows that sometimes. So much attention has been paid to her mental illness that I think it blurs or diminishes the incredible quality she was as a person. From the time I was 13, I thought she was the greatest thing in the world. If I were to conjure up a memory of Sylvia, it would be the first meeting we had on the floor of her dormitory room with the sun behind her and laughing. The class of 1950 at Wellesley High School had our 50th reunion 50 years later. And in order to commemorate that event, we agreed to have a bronze plaque made in her honor and placed in the high school. And the part of the, the plaque that I hold so dear to my heart is the verse that I chose to have written beneath her portrait, which is, I write, because there is a voice within me that will not be still. She was 15 when she wrote that. And as far as I'm concerned, that tells you what you need to know about Sylvia. <laughs>